Hi, my name is Alana. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And on this channel, we review books. So, oh man, this is a book I read in 2021, in May of 2021. The Greek Way by Edith Hamilton. It is a nonfiction and it was one of my top reads of 2021. And this is another one. If you've seen my little life review, I revisited that review for the first time since 2021. And I'm doing the same burping with The Greek Way because this book is so good, especially if you're a fan of the ancient Greeks and their literature and their culture and how they viewed politics and their philosophy. This is going to be right up your alley. I did a halfway review for this too. And then I did a final review summarizing all of my thoughts. And there's a lot to to, to, to discuss here, but I think it's worth it because this is fantastic. It's such a, it's such a good book. Um, and so I'm going to read through my halfway review so you can see what was going on in my mind as I was reading it uh, the first time. And then I'll go over the second half, the second, uh, the final review. So summarizing everything. So, and there's just so much information. It's not a big book, as you can see, it's a slim volume, but it deserves a lot of attention because Hamilton, chef's kiss. The Greek Way is a nonfiction and Hamilton has been revered for her extensive knowledge on the ancient Greek, on ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And she was even made an honorary citizen of Athens due to her writings and research. So at the time of my first time reading this, it had been 11 years since my Greek civilization class that I took in university and it had been nine years since my Greek and Roman warfare class which was the hardest class I've ever taken in my academic career. It was so difficult that that class came with a disclaimer. And the professor said, half of you will drop out when you see the syllabus. <laughs> and he was right. Um, that was a difficult class. Your girl aced it, but it put me, it made me work. <laughs> and I was just in the mood for a refresher on the cultural, religious, political, and literary literary elements of ancient Greece. And so that's why I decided to read this book. I didn't have to read it in university, but um, I love classical history and classical literature. You know, Hamilton's writing style, first off, is beautiful, even for nonfiction. You know, nonfiction can sometimes be stereotyped as being stuffy, but it just reads so well, this particular Hamilton reads so well and it's lyrical and it's evident that Hamilton adores the topic that she's writing about the ancient Greeks you can tell she loves the ancient Greeks and it almost reads like a love letter to them and she's so enthusiastic and so she begins by explaining what sets the ancient Greeks apart from other ancient civilizations such as the Egyptians or the Persians, she makes the argument that the Greeks are doing some, something completely different. And without their accomplishments, Western civil, civilization could not have been birthed. None of the great civilizations that preceded them and surrounded them served them as a model. With them, something completely new came into the world. They were the first Westerners. The spirit of the West, the modern spirit, is a Greek discovery and the place of the Greeks is the modern world. The ancient Greeks were rationalist, putting emphasis on reason, logic, and intellect. They broke away from a structure of society in which priests were the head and centered around and centered society of the important, sorry, they deviated from the structure that priests were the head of society and they centered their society on the importance of independent thought. The ancient Greeks would argue that the priests at the head knowledge and power are controlled by the religious institution control knowledge and power in one controls the people from here we see the birth of personal autonomy and the value of independent thought and free speech the right of a man to say what he pleased was fundamental in athens a slave is he who cannot speak his thought said euripides this was a society that also loved knowledge and so this is the type of society in which those who are seeking knowledge can flourish. The Greeks were intellectualists. They had a passion for using their minds. The fact shines through even in their use of language. Our word for school comes from the Greek word for leisure. 
The ancient Greeks embraced the human condition, the human condition, excuse me, which can be clearly seen in their literature. The style of their writings is a bit binary, often blatantly displaying good and black, bad, black and white, grief and joy, simultaneously within the text, often at the same time. So this coexistence is, are, is, is this, so this existence of polar opposites reveals how the ancient Greeks acknowledge the complexities of life. Think of the Greek tragic hero or heroine they are embodied they are the embodiment of strength and flaws and are not immune to disasters often of their own doing also what sets their literature apart is how matter of fact it reads so greek is a very difficult language to translate they have multiple words for just what would equate to one word in english for example they have six different words to indicate different types of love in English, we just use multiple descriptors or adjectives to describe like unconditional love, romantic love, platonic love, right? So they have their own distinct words for all of these things. It often seems when translated with any degree of literalness, they are so unlike what we are used to as even to repel. The ancient Greeks saw no need for, for, for flamboyancy for flowery, exaggerated descriptions, like for example, we see in Charles Dickens and many of the other Victorians. They wouldn't have understood that type of writing at all, actually. They practically wrote about what they saw, and if they were to read a Victorian novel, they would think it was complete and utter, non complete and utter nonsense. They would think it was just a waste of space and tell you to get to the point. The ancient Greeks would have looked sideways at Shakespeare. <laughs> a skylark was just a skylark. Birds were birds and nothing else, but how beautiful a thing was, but how beautiful a thing was a bird that flies over the foam of the wave of the wave with careless heart, sea purple, bird of spring. The ancient Greeks, their literature Edith talks about was bold and even vulgar at times. So Hamilton's text talks about how Aristophanes is capable of more kinds of vulgarity and indecency than Shakespeare ever dreamed of. Aristophanes in particular wrote comedic plays and during his time no one was off limits. The way that these ancient Greeks would write about politicians we could we could never. <laughs> they saw beneath the surface of the passing show they wrote of the purely ephem that word it's hard to say some of these words out loud. They wrote of the pu purely ephemeral and in their hands, it backs a picture, not of the follies and foibles of a day in a nation, but of those that exist in all nations and all ages and, ages and belongs and belong to the permanent stuff of human nature. The ancient Greeks would look at us today and scoff at this obsession to be politically correct, because in doing so, you're trying to overcorrect yourself and you're trying to overcorrect the complexities in the contradictions that we have within ourselves that make us fascinating. The Greeks would scoff at that because for them, it also provides good, good comedic material. They would say that a culture or a civilization that can laugh at itself is a healthy society. So I think in today's society, we have something to definitely learn from the ancient Greeks. The Greek way discusses uh, Herodotus, um, who was arguably can be considered one of the first historians, if not the first historian. And our modern concept of history comes from Herodotus. The word historia literally means investigation. Herodotus traveled widely, and so he saw people and met people from all over, even if he didn't necessarily believe all that was told to him. <laughs> so for the ancient Greeks and for Herodotus, the idea of truth in which person to which personal bias and justice must prejudice must yield, not justice. So in other words, write what you see. Examine what you see and leave your feelings at the door. Very Greek concept here. Ancient Greek concept here. Let's go into the second half. I need to blow my nose. One second. Okay. Let's go to the second half of the review. Hmm. I'm trying to see what if there's anything here I don't feel like I need to discuss too much. Let's see. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. That's that's good stuff. Okay, so he, he Hamilton goes through after she kind of sets up in this book the ideas of the Greeks, what they valued in society, how they viewed things. She goes through key writers, many of them, and so she talks about Herodotus, 
many of the uh, tragic playwrights. She goes through Thucydides as a historian as well. For example, Thucydides, he believed that human nature does not change and is subject to previous mistakes. And she goes through all this just to see how, to show the reader how the Greeks viewed things and how those, um, how we have still maintained a lot of these concepts and ideas uh, in the West. Thucydides talks a lot about how power corrupts. And so I pointed that out because that's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> And he considered power to be the ultimate evil corrupter of men. I don't think he's necessarily wrong there. Of how detrimental it can be to society as a whole. So I think we have Thucydides to thank for being one of the individuals who laid the groundwork for modern democracy. Freedom in the great sense, not only equality before the law, but freedom of thought and speech. Then we have Hamilton who ventures into Xenophon and other another individual whose thoughts were critical to the formation of democracies. The ancient Greeks, Hamilton ha hammers this home, valued their freedom and their ability to think for themselves. So personal autonomy and the Athenians in particular promoted free thought. There is no agency or institution to oppose his thinking in any way he chose on anything whatsoever. So Hamilton even talks about how in a lot of ways, the ancient Greeks were more free than we are. Um, often many of us are, you know, in our comfortable living. And many of us uh, in various democracies around the world. We have what the Greeks considered to be good leaders and good leadership. A valued Athenian was an Athenian who was invested in public affairs. Um, again, I'm kind of skimming this. I think that in my second half of the review, I don't think it's, it's a little bit um, repetitive. We've talked about this. Ah, let's talk about Greek tragedies, ancient Greek tragedies and why they're so unique. Hamilton spends a lot of, of several chapters discussing this. She says that tragedy was a Greek creation because in Greece, thought was free. Men were thinking more and more deeply about human life and beginning to perceive more and more clearly that it was bound up with evil and that injustice was of the nature of, was of the nature of things. So I'm not going to go into depth about everything that she covers because again, it was several chapters, but it was just too much material. But in a nutshell, she talks about Sophocles and Euripides and others, the great tragedians who have written some of the most iconic Greek plays such as Antigone, the Agamemnon, the Medea, or and Medea, etc. Um, there was a point, and I'm reading this now, again, this is my first time revisiting this review since writing it, where I disagree with Hamilton. So she does compare, ooh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, one of the Greek tragedians to the book of Ezekiel. Or was it a name of, no, it was one of the Greek, I don't know how to, S. Julius? I'm probably so wrong. She compares it to the book, sorry, the book of Ezekiel, which is the Old Testament in the Bible. And it was written around the same time. She states that the Jew was content with thus saith the Lord, an attitude that leaves no place for tragedy in the world. He would accept the irrational and rest in it serenely. The actual fact before him did not confront his inescapability as it did the Greeks. I disagreed with that, actually. Um, I thought it was a bit of confirmation bias. Uh, the Bible was a complete work, and I feel like she isolated that to prove her point um, because there are many other examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament that would negate this. I said, let's talk about the Old Testament because that's where Ezekiel is found. So I feel like Hamilton actually misinterpreted here. There are so many instances in the Old Testament in which people were not passive at all. They were not, oh, just thus says the Lord. People in the Bible contended with God all the time and often did things in free will. And um, they often contended with, they were not passive. They just didn't say, oh, this is what it is. Come see, come saw. God does say it. So let me do what I, let, let, let go and let God. No, that was not often the case. <laughs> David contended with God to spare his son that he had had with a woman out of wedlock who was married to another mother, another man. He killed her husband. 
to take his wife because he thought Bathsheba was so fine. Um, and he continued with God after he committed murder and adultery to spare his son. His son was not spared, but Hannah contended and pleaded with God to say, give her a child. She was bullied by, for being childless. And she contended and pleaded with God so fervently and passionately that someone thought she was drunk and God honored her request. Jacob literally wrestled with God and dislocated his hip in that tussle. <laughs> Moses, people forget about Aaron in the Bible. Moses had a stutter. And when God appointed Moses to lead the Jews out of Egypt, God compromised with Moses because Moses was not a good speaker. He did not want to go back to Egypt and face Pharaoh and lead the Jews out. He was too self-conscious about some things. Um, so God, um, God allowed, I don't know if compromise is the right word, but God worked with Moses and said, fine, I'm going to allow your brother Aaron to speak for you. And so in the movie, the Prince of Egypt, uh, it doesn't highlight Aaron really. It just, you know, Moses is the one saying, let my people go. It was Aaron speaking for Moses because Moses was self-conscious about his stutter. So it's not just, okay, God, whatever you say, I'm going to blindly follow you. No, that's actually contrary to the faith. As the word says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For any, everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh. They, of course, know everything within God's will, of course. But this is a faith-based relationship. And I think that Hamilton missed this. It's not a dictator in the sky, just blindly like pulling the strings, do what you're told. Um, leave your own desires, concerns, and heartaches at the door. Um, that is actually not the case here. So I did disagree with Hamilton on that because, again, I feel like she missed some of the very human experiences that are portrayed in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. But I stuck to the Old Testament because that's what she pulled an example from. Again, go look at David and Bathsheba. He done killed that. Okay, yeah. Just go look at David and Bathsheba, Aaron and Moses. Moses was like, Lord, I, I really don't want to get out here in front of these people because I, I don't speak too well. So Aaron spoke better than Moses. So the Lord said, I'm going to send your brother with you. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm off my soapbox. But I did think it was odd that she was trying to compare these Hebrew texts to the Greek texts in this way. I just didn't think, I thought it was a bit of a stretch. I thought it was a bit of a stretch because, uh, these are very different cultures and religious beliefs. And it just, I thought she was too narrow-minded with it. Anyway, I think that The Greek Way is a fantastic book, a fantastic piece of nonfiction. If you are a person seeking to dive into ancient Greek literature and maybe you don't know where to start, she quotes so many plays and um, where does, you know, philosophies and stuff where you can start. So she also has The Roman Way. Maybe I'll do a review on that one too. And so, you know, that one, I, but I, the Greek way I think was just, I gave this a five out of five. And if you are a person also who is passionate about or interested in thoughts on free speech, modern democracy and where that comes from, civil liberties, etc., I think it's worth the read. It is a short read, but it is a dense read. And I remember when I first read it, despite the shorter length, it's like 200 and something pages. It took me a while to get through because I had to process so much at a time, but well worth the read. And it's also one of those fiction, nonfiction books where you can just, especially if you annotate it, if you're an annotator, you'll reference it um, for various topics. So anyway, that's all. Have you read The Greek Way? Are you a fan of the ancient Greeks? I personally am a fan, like I said, of the ancient Greeks in ancient Romans. And so feel free to leave me a comment, like, subscribe, and also feel free to follow me on Instagram where I get up to more book shenanigans. Um, and I post goofy, th had my, there was not a thought going on behind those eyes. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to fade. And uh, I post goofy things in the Instagram stories because we all need a good laugh. And I look down, I burn myself in a 400 degree oven, but there's that. Anyway, I will see you in the next one. <laughs> Bye.